Um, so, like Patrick said, we're going to be talking about malware behavior. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of very heavyweight talks today, um, so I'm going to give your brain a little bit of a rest here. This is not going to be um, really, really you know, deep. It's going to be very high level. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Thomas Reed. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I work for Malwarebytes. Um, and when I am not you know, managing products or reversing malware or whatnot, I, I am an avid photographer. Um, so let's jump right in here. I only got 25 minutes. So um, let's look at some specific behaviors that malware generally likes to have. So persistence, obviously, that's a big one. You know, if malware can't stay running, what good is it? Now, in certain cases, it's not that important, but the majority of the time, malware wants persistence. Um, malware also often likes to make system configuration changes. So, you know, changes to various system um, files, uh, host file, you know, pseudo file, stuff like that. Um, installing system configuration profiles, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, malware likes to be hidden as well, obviously. So there are a variety of ways that malware tries to stay hidden on the system. Um, and then malware needs network communication as well, you know, for downloading additional payloads, for exfiltrating data. Um, you know, so obviously those are some pretty important capabilities that malware has to have. Problem is, these are also all things legitimate applications have to be able to do. So where, where do you draw the line? Like what's, what's malware and what's not? Um, so the difference here really keys off of um, the, those differences and what kind of behaviors are suspicious and which ones are not. And sometimes this is a very blurry line. Sometimes it's very, very sharp. It just depends. So we're going to look at a whole bunch of these kinds of suspicious behaviors that you might see. Um, so we're going to start with kind of, you know, the easy, obvious stuff. So um, launch DT lists. We've talked a lot about launch agents and launch daemons. Um, so here's an example. Um, this was found in some malware that we identify as bad word. Um, that's more because John Lambert, who discovered it, didn't really name it, and we had to call it something in our database. So, you know, that's what we called it. Um, and this malware, basically it was a, um, a Microsoft Word macro uh, that did a sandbox escape and wrote a PLS file to the system. Um, interestingly, uh, it actually stole the code from Adam Chester, who wrote a, a proof of concept. Even the name of this thing um, is from his website. Um, so, but obviously here you see in this plist, if you can see it back in the back, there's Python code being executed straight from the plist file, and that's like you'll never see that in a legitimate. PLS. At least you shouldn't. We would hope you'd never see that in a legitimate PLS. Uh, in this case, that opened up an interpreter backdoor. Um, you'll also see launch deep PLS that are pretending to be apples. This is a very common technique. It's kind of a lame technique, and I'm, I wonder how often it actually works, but I see it all the time. Um, so you can see in this screenshot here, those are just three examples from uh, Evil Egg, Darth Miner, and Lane Pyre, all of which appeared last year, late last year. Um, so that's highly suspicious. The problem here is that there are a few legitimate com.apple.plists that you'll see outside the system folder. So you can't just automatically assume that every com.apple.plist that you see in the user's launch agents directory or some, somewhere like that is automatically bad. Some are actually legit. Cron tasks have been mentioned a couple of times uh, over the course of the conference here. 
Um, these days, cron tests really are not used much. I think the only thing that I've seen a cron task for in legitimate software lately was really old versions of super duper. Um, so really, if you see a cron task being used, it's probably malicious, uh, unless maybe you set it up yourself. Um, so here we've got two different examples of cron, uh, cron abuses. The top one there is from uh, some malware that we call research. Um, it's also called Pirate, uh, which was discussed yesterday. Uh, and here it's just running a process called stateliness.hu. Nothing suspicious about that at all. Um, and then the bottom one here was actually from a, uh, an old um, word macro malware. Uh, and you can see it calls this, you know, Apple script that does a shell script that writes a file out, loads it up in cron, and then deletes the file. So you've got this task going at all times, but there's no evidence left on the hard drive. <laughs> but you can still see that the cron task is there. We mentioned uh, pseudoers file changes as one of the system configuration changes that malware likes to make. Um, you can see here two examples from the malware doc and proton. The top one was from doc. Um, and what that does is it allows the, uh, the current user, which was test in this case, to do anything with sudo without having to have a password. Um, the bottom one there was from Proton, and that basically uh, sets the system so that there is one single pseudo timer going. So most of the time on macOS, you open up two terminal windows, uh, and you do sudo in one of them. It starts up a timer going. You have a certain amount of time to continue using sudo before it asks you for a password again. The other terminal window does not have that same timer going. If you do sudo in there, it, it starts a new timer. Um, this actually makes it so that if you do sudo, any process anywhere on the system can then use sudo without a password. Um, so you, if you can imagine malware could sit there in the background, just waiting for you to run something with sudo and then pounce on that and get a privilege escalation. Um, and these would typically be used in cases where the malware was able to somehow get root access to write to these files, but maybe didn't have continued root access to do later operations and um, wanted to be able to have that capability. Hosts file also is one that's commonly manipulated. Um, uh, most of the time that I see it manipulated, it's actually because somebody has installed a uh, pirated version of some Adobe product. Uh, so if you see that, it's not malicious, but it's highly suspicious, and that machine probably needs a little once over just to make sure the user hasn't installed something they shouldn't have. Um, but some malware, such as Doc, um, which we'll be referring to repeatedly because it's done some very interesting things. I uh, actually use this to block a whole bunch of Apple servers as well as virus total. Um, so that's really, really suspicious. You should not see either of those getting blocked in the host file. Uh, another research example here, and there are going to be several of these kind of chained together. Um, so research, or peer it, um, used a hidden user. So when it installed on the system, it would create a user with an ID of 401, which means that it's totally hidden, doesn't show up in system preferences or anywhere else. Um, you kind of have to know what you're doing to spot the user. Um, and it, this user was used with a PF rule. Um, and it was used to run a proxy. So all the users' HTTP traffic was proxied through a process using that was running under that user. Um, so this was a good way to hide the, that proxy um, and keep it from being noticed. Uh, and it was a good way also to um, for research to actually inject ads into your HTTP traffic. Um, 
This could very easily have been used to sniff your traffic. Um, fortunately, it wasn't. Um, but in general, a hidden user is a big red flag. And if your system's got PF rules on it that you don't know are there, that's also a huge red flag. Uh, another case of proxy um, settings is in Doc. Uh, Doc, you can see here, it ran a proxy through uh, port 5555 on the local host. Um, and it, it did it differently. So you've got to kind of keep an eye on a variety of different ways that proxies can be set up. You know, proxy settings, PF rules, etc. cetera. Um, another way to do proxying is through trusted certificates. Um, so you kind of have to keep an eye on your, your keychain and making sure that there aren't some weird certificates in there that are, shouldn't be there. So the doc malware actually installed this Komodo certificate here on the, the right side. Uh, and it used that to proxy not just HTTP, but HTTPS traffic. Um, in that case, the intent was not to inject ads, but actually to sniff the traffic. Um, we, we've also seen MITM proxy, which is an open source proxy tool. Uh, lately, that has been used in a lot of adware and malware, um, both for the purposes of injecting ads and sniffing traffic. Uh, and as was mentioned yesterday, titanium web proxy is another one that's now joined the fray and is being abused by malware. Um, both of those last two, they're completely legitimate, open source, there's nothing wrong with them, but if you see them on a system and you don't think that user has a, a, a reason to have them there, that's a huge red flag. Probably they're there for malicious purposes. Um, process behavior is another big thing that you've got to look at. Um, so for example, anything that's running from temp, if you look at the list of running processes and something's running from temp, that's a huge red flag. Uh, Slayer is just one example here, but there are many, many others. Most adware droppers will do this sort of thing. You know, they'll down, they'll curl something down into the temp folder and then run it. Um, so in this case, um, this just shows that uh, Schlayer was um, running a script that curled a file down into, into the temp folder and was running it. And I think we've seen that code already um, at least twice, maybe. <laughs> so Schlayer has been well covered at this conference. Um, running from hidden locations. That's also another big no-no. And when I say hidden locations, I don't mean like, you know, slash user, because uh, that's, it's a hidden folder, um, but it's no fairly normal for processes to be running out of there. I mean hidden as in like some weird folder that starts, uh, the name starts with a period, so it's hidden from the user. That's not the way that Apple typically does things. So, and it shouldn't be the way that normal legitimate software does things either. You can see in this case with evil egg um, in this plist file, it's running a an executable that is invisible from a folder that is also invisible. Um, and that's really, really suspicious. Um, in the case of real-time spy, it was actually an application that was made invisible and loaded through a, long, a login item instead of a launch agent. Um, process behavior here, um, uh, you know, this is just another way that some of this malware gets installed. It's, it's through Apple script or automator scripts, which is kind of interesting. And it's, it's weird because all this is is a carrier for a shell script. Um, so in, in both the case of Darkminer and Langpire, automator scripts were used. And their entire purpose was to do nothing but run a shell script. So this one here, this is from Darth Miner. Um, you can see that it curls something down from kind of a weird URL. Uh, and then pipes it to Python. And then 
it um, curls something else down and unpacks it and runs it. Um, so that's pretty suspicious, obviously. Um, you know, just that behavior itself and the fact that it's wrapped up in an automator script is e e even worse. Um, now, in the case of lame tire, the script was, uh, it, it was kind of lame malware, but the script was much more interesting. Um, so it had this long bit of uh, base64 encoded data. And it took that and decoded it and piped it into Python. Um, and then, after while that was running, it went into this loop here. And it started doing a screen capture. And it did it in such a way so that the, the, um, the sound wouldn't play. So you wouldn't know that a screen capture had been done. Saved it in the temp folder as a file named alloy.png. I don't know why that file name. And then it used Perl to upload that to a command and control server. And it did this over and over and over and over again as fast as it could. You know, so as soon as it's created and uploaded a screen capture, it's doing it all over again. This was kind of noisy though. I mean, obviously there's, this is a lot of web traffic going out because it's basically constantly uploading something. Uh, but even worse, the whole time this was running up in the menu bar was a little gear icon for Automator just going around and around and around. And, um, I think somebody mentioned that yesterday and said that you, you could make it so that it would just run for like half a second and then go away. Evidently, they didn't know how to do that. So um, it just would keep going and going. And so it was right there just sort of waving like a big red flag at you. Um, Network connections are another thing to look at, especially network connections to Tor. Now, Tor is a legitimate um, thing. It's, it's not malicious in and of itself. But if you see a weird process that shouldn't be on the system uh, communicating with Tor, that's a problem. Um, in this case, Doc used this key list here, com.apple.safari that proxy, that plist, nothing suspicious at all there, right? Um, and you can see here in this code, it was directly running an open source tool uh, and using that to, uh, you know, proxy traffic through a dot .onion address. Um, so that's like just about everything about this is suspicious. Um, but specifically, if we look at the that Tor traffic going out through some random plist file, you know, a, a process launched by a, a random plist file. That's that's really sketchy. Um, we also have seen lately uh, a, a growing number of processes signed not with an Apple certificate, but with ad hoc certs. Um, I'm kind of shocked that this still works. I would think that Apple would not want this to work at all uh, because these are things that can run because they're not unsigned, but Apple has no control over them. Like Apple can't revoke the certificate. Um, so this was done by both research and some adware that was otherwise pretty uninteresting that we call Facebook, um, imitated the Facebook app. Uh, and if you look at the code sign information for both of those, you'll see uh, team identifiers not set, signatures <laughs> listed as ad hoc. The um, bundle identifier can be, it can look legitimate or it can be kind of sketchy. Like, I, I don't know what they were thinking with UPD dash some long number. That doesn't look at all like a bundle identifier. Um, but if you see applications that are signed like this, that's a really, really big red flag. Um, a shell script as an app executable. So, you know, it's you're used to seeing a Mako binary in there as the executable inside of an app, but you can actually replace that with a shell script. The only time I've ever seen that done has been with Schlayer. Uh, which I'm not going to dive any more deeply into this script here because it's already been discussed at least twice over the course of the conference. But 
Suffice it to say that if you follow this script through, you'll go down a deep rabbit hole of repeating, you know, obfuscated scripts and curls and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it all starts off from this shell script inside the app bundle in the, the contents macOS folder, which is really weird. Um, so if you see that, that's, that's not right. No legitimate software does that. Uh, and then a couple more items here regarding installation. Um, so in this case, we're talking about vSearch. Um, vSearch, and this is kind of an older version of vSearch, um, it did some analysis avoidance directly in the install process. So inside the PKG file, uh, it had a pre-install script. That pre-install script, I've trimmed out a lot of it because a lot of it's fairly uninteresting. Um, but if you look here, what it's doing is it's calling um, IO reg, and it's getting some information about the device. And then it's piping it through a whole bunch of sequences of, you know, aux and grep and whatnot to try to get the vendor name out of there. Um, and you can see very, very clearly there, it's, it's not even obfuscated in any way. It's looking for Parallels, VirtualBox, Oracle, and VMware. Um, and that was fairly effective at actually detecting a VM and bailing out. Um, so you can see there it says, is VM equals one, is VM equals two, or it equals zero. Um, and so if it, if it was in a VM, it would fail out after that. <laughs> Um, this was pretty easy to get around if you had this sample. You just, as Jared was talking about, you, you expand the package with PKG util. Um, you change that if else and you flatten it again. And this wasn't signed in any way, so you didn't have to worry about a signature. Um, so, uh, but that kind, that kind of behavior, that kind of analysis avoidance is really, really very common in malware. Um, it's not always quite this obvious. Um, you know, there has been some discussion about analysis avoidance is very sneaky at the conference. This is just blatant and it's easy to spot. Unfortunately, they're not really doing it this way anymore. It's gotten to be sneakier and you don't see this kind of obvious analysis avoidance anymore. Uh, and then we've got flashback. Now this is a this is a flashback to um, almost a decade ago at this point. Um, so this is very very old malware, and it actually did the installation in the pre-install script. So you run the PKG file and you know maybe, maybe you decide to bail out and you cancel the installation, you quit the installer. Too late, it's already done. So um, this kind of thing is pretty nasty. So you can see here, actually in this case, the pre-install script was a Mako binary, um, which is fairly rare. I mean, as was mentioned, you can have really anything as the pre-install script, but traditionally it's a it's like a bash. Sometimes I guess a Ruby script or something like that, as Jaron mentioned. Uh, in this case, it was a Mako binary. I think this is the only time I've ever actually seen that. Uh, and a Hopper uh, screenshot would have been a little bit too big to really meaningfully display here. So I I just sort of stuck to showing the strings. Uh, just to make sure that you can see it in the back. I'll zoom in a little bit. So you can see a lot of nasty things here. You can see a reference to little snitch. So this script would actually look for the presence of little snitch. And if little snitch was present, it would bail out. It would not install any of the stuff that it hit, any of its payload. Um, and the reason for that is that this was going to exfiltrate some information, and if a little snitch was there, it wouldn't be able to do so. Um, and you can also see a number of other nasty things, like I've got 
outline there that it did launch control load and then it set uh, an environment variable. It set a, a um, dynamic library to be inserted uh, into the system. So uh, lots of nasty stuff there. There's a you know an su command in there. There's I mean all kinds of nasty stuff. It's um, and this was all done in the pre-install script. So it happened before you even, you know, like you would never have realized that anything had been installed if you didn't complete the installation process. Um, and that's something that I'm kind of surprised we haven't seen more of because the pre-install script is the perfect place to drop some nasty stuff on your system. Um, you know, be, because it happened so early in the process. Um, so that is it. Um, pretty short and sweet. Uh, any questions? All right. Um, what's the craziest thing you've seen recently in the wild? So you'd say, wow, that is mind-bogglingly kind of interesting. Craziest? Um, I. There really hasn't been anything really wildly crazy lately. It's actually been kind of quiet this year. We've seen a lot of adware, a lot of pups. Um, the, the worst stuff we're seeing right now really comes from the pup world. You know, we're seeing things like um, lots of kind of like polymorphism. We're seeing a lot of pups that are proliferating in numbers and every single one of them has a different name. Um, and, and the one in question here that I'm thinking of, it started out as advanced Mac cleaner. Um, so you guys are probably, at least some of you are probably familiar with that. Um, it'll put up a window and it'll actually yell at you. It'll say, you know, your system is, I forget the exact wording, something's wrong with your system, you have to clean it now. Um, so it's, it really tried to scare you. And then all these other variants of it are all exact duplicates of that app. Um, and there are dozens and dozens of them at this point, and more, more appearing almost every day. So, but yeah, like as far as really cool, interesting, we're really not seeing it. You know, we've got all these theoretical exploits. We've seen some really great zero days. Um, you know, at this conference, and nobody's using them in the wild. Last year, I presented about code signing and how you could use that to actually establish persistence by worming an application. And still, you know, like nobody's done it. My paper is out there. It's at the virus, like it gets up on the virus bulletin website. You sound disappointed. And nobody's done it. <laughs> yeah, I mean. All of us in this room, we, we could do, each and every one of us could do malware better than the malware authors are doing it right now. And I don't understand why it's not being done. Not that, not that I want it, but <laughs> may, it would make my life more interesting, at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, do you see stalkerware on Mac at all? And, and what is malware bytes policy for, for, for classifying that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we definitely do see stalkerware. Um, I, that has become a big, a big thing these days, lots of talk about it. Um, we have actually been very strong against stalkerware uh, before it became called stalkerware. You know, it's we will detect any kind of not just malicious spyware, but you know, so-called legitimate spyware that you can go to a website and buy, um, which I guess is what they're referring to when people say stalkerware. And we'll we'll detect all of that stuff, and we have. On the Mac side, we have uh, since I've been with the company, um, basically since the product first existed. So, 